How would you like to save a ton of money on fishing tackle this holiday season? If you join the Fishing the DMV Patreon, you'll receive 5% off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. That's 5% off all your orders every single month. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you'll be a part of the Fishing the DMV community where you'll receive 5% off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. You will also gain access to our private Facebook group community, entered to win weekly prize giveaways with the winner being announced during Monday Night Live, have access to members-only live streams and video content, we will be doing monthly competitions and so much more. And you'll be a part of a community that's striving to create our own nonprofit to help our local fisheries. For $6 a month, you're going to be receiving 5% off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, whether online or in person. For more information, check out the link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Uh, we have a really cool guest tonight. We actually did a live stream the other day, believe it or not, on the old Lake Frederick, the place that men fear. Uh, I hope we hear from Boyd Duckett tonight. Boyd Duckett tonight, Jr. Yes, so guys, um, ba basically this is how we're going to be going around this. We will be doing a call-in show. We have the number all set. We're going to do our intro first because the last time I did the call-in show, I was immature. I didn't realize don't put the number up first because all hell breaks loose. So we're going to save that till the end of the show. But like always with all these Monday Night Lives, if you ask a good question in the comment section and I pick your question, you will win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. You're going to win a $5 gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. It's quite easy. You ask a question and then you enter automatically to win. And I will be randomly picking questions as the winner tonight, as always. Uh, last housekeeping thing next week is our two year anniversary of the show, two years. And we're going to be from Jake's Bait and Tackle with two special guests for the live stream. So that will be, and this is some shit I should have written down, but I don't do that ever. Uh, that will be what day is it? That'd be the 27th. So next Monday, the 27th will be live from Jake's Bait and Tackle for the two year anniversary of the show. And then last piece of housekeeping is our Patreon is absolutely taken off. Thank you guys so much. I'm cutting back to only one show a week until we hit 100 Patreon supporters. 100 Patreon supporters for all the work that we put in here at the show, and we're at 54. So we're more than halfway there. Once we hit 100 subscribers, I'll be going back to two, three, four shows a week, no problem. But until then, all we need is less than 50 Patreon subscribers to get us back to where we need to go. Now all the housekeeping's done, all that boring crap. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, this guy really tamed a lake, a lake that men fear. When MVKBA went there for the championship, it was it was frustrating, but not for this guy. The man, the myth, the legend. Ace, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate no, it. No, no, no. Don't say that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Too good of an introduction there. Uh, guy, I got to hype you up. I mean, what you were doing yeah. on that lake. It, so guys, a little bit of a, uh, like, let's give a timeline here. Last fall, we interviewed the guy at the bait shop that, at, at uh, Lake Frederick. And he really told us about the blueback herring. And that opened up my mind to the way that these fish could potentially be caught. Fast forward to last winter, and you are blowing up Instagram with some of these insane catches that you were pulling out of that place. Yeah. It, it, like you said, it definitely has something to do with the blueback because I'm just out there sniping them. I mean, just constantly on the move. It was a little different. We didn't move as much when we went out yesterday. Um. But yeah, that's that's all I'm doing out there. Like before we get into Lake Frederick, as always, how did you get into fishing, especially in Northern Virginia? I mean, we all know Cashburn, and basically that's what Percival and Leesburg are becoming is basically Cashburn 2.0. A lot of people would think that there's not a lot of fishing opportunities. So how did you get into it? Uh, well, I got in, into it with my brother Matt. Uh, we used to go down to Lake Caston all the time, and my grandfather actually had a 12 foot plastic boat that my dad let us take out and we would be gone for 12 hours a day and we'd go there about every weekend and uh or every other weekend and that's really how we got into fishing and then once we got back here you know, you'd walk the potomac here and there and fish or hit some ponds i mean i even remember hitting a pond along a bike path at one point mm. and i mean this this is how we got into it and then from there you go from beating the bank down at lake gaston to fishing a lot of tournaments up at the res like, what was that transition like uh that was tough 
our first tournament, we went out. It was pouring rain for the entire tournament. And we we're in that plastic dinghy too. Really? And we thought, yeah, we thought everybody struggled. We're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, we didn't catch anything, of course, because that place will humble you quick. And when we got back, I think they broke records that tournament. Somebody weighed in like a seven pounder. And at that time, uh, I mean, we were like 14, 15. I might have been 13 at the time. Uh, but yeah, it was wild, man. But we just stuck with it. And we eventually started catching them, finding spots and stuff. When did you get that first? When, when did you evolve past the, the plastic boat to a, the John boat? Uh, we were at the res. So I think we saw, or my dad saw a poster up at uh, the house that they have there. Or like the little marina place. And it was like three or four hundred bucks. It had a little nine nine on the back. I think it was a 12 foot. Uh, what was it? Uh, I forget what type of boat it was exactly. I'm sure Matt will put it in the comments here in a second. But I mean, it was what we had at the time. We made it work. I, I think that's an that, interesting thing about this interview when I was thinking about this is how I wanted to approach it with your brother, because I do, I understand I have a brother too. And this is, this is, this is your episode here, but also it's immature just to ignore the other fact. And I think yeah. that's so interesting because it intertwines everything into the story here. Uh, your brother is a, is a content creator. He's a YouTuber, SB fishing. And from your perspective, looking in, I guess the first question is, are, are you the youngest or are you the oldest? And then how did that dynamic grow over time? Uh, no, I'm the second. There's four of us. Uh, I'm just learning more line. about you every time. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was talking about you for five yeah, hours and I didn't ask that. <laughs> yeah. No. But yeah, I'm the second. And it's really, it's my brother and I, we just, we fish together all the time. And that's how it really grew from there. Starcraft. It, and it's on. funny. I, oh, yeah, it is a Starcraft. And I, if, if you put it, it was 12 feet, I think it was. 12 feet. Yeah. But it was funny. So we took it out. It was completely empty, and we took it out in the Potomac, and we were running it with my brother and my dad, and we were hauling. I mean, we were moving quick, and then we built the deck. It was all plywood, and once we got into it, we were doing maybe 10, 12 miles an hour. You're rolling, man. You're rolling down the river. Yeah. Oh. But hey, uh, if McCluskey's watching, he knows you don't need to move fast to win those tournaments out there. You can win it right next to the ramp. A 12-foot boat, though, dude. I get... So if you guys don't know, because it's hard along these videos, and the first thing people say is like, I'm a lot taller than people think. I think it's the camera angle. I'm about six I one. I didn't yeah. say anything. But as soon as you got out of your truck, I was like, oh, this dude's big. <laughs> yeah, I, I for concept, I'm I'm six one and I'm built like a, a a running back. So when I hear people saying like, oh, I'm in a 14 foot John boat, 12 foot John boat, I feel like I'm one hook set away from us all drowning. Like, I don't think. Well, I could cool. actually next, next time it. we go out, we can take my John boat and see how that works out. Hell yes, that's great. <laughs> yes, on the next episode of uh, I Shouldn't Be Alive. <laughs> yeah, but you know, anyway, back on track. So, how did you guys then evolve? Did you start fishing more than I guess as as his channel started to kick off? Were you guys sharing a boat, and then you had to find like another place to fish? Like, how did that all work? Well. He, he was the one who had a John boat at first. I didn't have one for a long time. So he ended up getting, if people, it, it was like a small 12 foot John boat and we fished uh, the res in it. And anytime I would fish, it was on that boat. So Starcraft, then his boat? Yeah. So okay. we had that, we, we had that Starcraft for a while and I forget, I honestly forget what happened to it. Then he got the, his John boat from a buddy, Trevor of ours. And then we got back into fishing uh, the res tournaments. So we fished out of StarCraft for a while. Kind of stopped fishing for about a year or two. Then got back into it when he got his John boat. And then from then it just took off. That's interesting. Yeah, it's such a family affair. And, and I know that because I fished, I fished high school and college terms with my brother. What is that? Like just at competing with your brother. Is that a, a how do I word this? When my brother and I fish together, we're an interesting couple um, because of our styles of fishing and how we can feed off of each other for positive and, and negative. Um, is, is that something that really has changed as you guys have gotten older? Has it gotten easier to fish or has it, it always it, been the same way? We share the same brain. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we'll fish a tournament 
and like we're going down the bank and I'll be like, oh, okay, this spot looks good for like, just say a crankbait. I look over at Matt, he's picking it up. And I was like, dude, that's exactly what I was going to do or vice versa. And it's been that way ever since, so, because we fish together so much, we know each other's ways. Like, okay, I'm going to throw this here. I'm going to throw that there. And it's, we just have the same brain when it comes to fishing. Is that a positive or a negative as you get older? Do you feel it, like you get into a law? It, I'll say, I guess it could hurt in a tournament aspect because you kind of want to do different things until you key in on what they want. But we're always changing stuff around. So, I mean, we figure it out sometimes. Not all the time. <laughs> you guys did pretty damn well. You gave you gave McCluskey a run for his money. In the classic, we did on the first day. It was close, but you know, <laughs> you know how he is. There's no beating that dude, man. There's no beating. Uh, I, um, uh, Matt, I know you're probably listening, but you know, it's the truth. You're the Terminator out there. Um, he's, yeah. he's, he, guys, if you don't know, there's a guy that's actually, he's, he's won once or twice out on, on, on the res also known as Aquaquan Reservoir. So that place really is, I think the Mecca for fishing in Northern Virginia, but, but there's other places too. Lake Frederick, how, how did you key in on that? How did all that go down? Like, well, so like I said the other day when we were on the boat, it all kind of started I fished it a couple times because I lived out in Winchester for a little while and I went out and I was just beating the bank because I didn't really have live scope. I had, what was it? It was like a Lowrance 12. I, it was a super small black and white graph. And basically all I used it for was depth and water temp. And, uh, oh, the cat meowing at me here. Um, and then after that, uh, once I got live scope, I kind of took what, my brother and I did down at OHIV earlier that year and then used that on Frederick. And then it just started working. I mean, fishing way deeper than I ever would have. And, uh, oops, sorry, camera's shaking. Off. And that's what's it's so interesting about, about that place is if, if you guys don't know, uh, Lake Frederick is, a, is, is not that big of a lake, uh, you know, all in all. I and mean, I think like Mooney's much bigger, no. Hunting Run Reservoir, places like that is way bigger than it. But it has like a fishbowl thing going on. You know, at the base where the dam is, it's probably 40, 50, you know, 60 yeah. feet. Like it, it's super deep. And then there is this introduction of a species, the blueback herring that are actually in there, which is really odd for such a small place. And that's a very pelagic bait fish species. Uh, for the people that follow the channel, you know how much I've talked about that from fishing the Carolina lakes. When I say that they're in there, oh, it's clouds, clouds of bait that have pulled these fish off the bank, and they're basically pelagic, 100%. Yeah, it, like I talked to you, I wish that grass was in there, man. It, it, I think it would be even better than what it was. Mm -hmm. No. I, or what it, it is. Yeah, I agree. I really tend to agree with that. I, I think the interesting thing about the bait, though, is I remember all the time growing up, there was grass, and then there's a. Then when the grass carp were in there, it started to get eaten away, and then the grass disappeared. And then everyone just assumed that there's no more bass in there. The bass are gone. Nope, they're there, and there's a ton of them, and they're big as hell. They're hiding. They're deep. They're hiding in the deep. Well, what is your PR out of there? Nine seven is like nine seven eight something like that. It's it's up on Instagram. But I had the actual weight, but I want to say it's nine seven. When did you catch that? I want to say that was late February. It was when it happened. Wow. It's either or no, sorry, sorry, sorry. It was late January, early February. It was when that happened. I'm gonna pull that picture up there for you for everyone just to be able to see yeah, this back. Find it real it's, quick. It's absolutely. I think. I think this is. I think this is the one. Let me pull this up. Uh, there we go. Terrible Wi-Fi down here. Let me know if that's the right one. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's it. And what's funny that's is that my, stud. my daughter was in the boat when I caught that fish. Oh, really? And yeah. Yeah. Because typically when I go, because I've got three kids. So when I go out, I tell my, my wife's always like, oh, okay, you got to take at least one of the kids. So I was taking my daughter. And when I hooked into it, I told her, I was like, please back up. Watch out. Watch out. <laughs> Something. I just, I was like, I got to grab this thing. Did you boat flip it or did you go down to your knees and just yeah. like grab it? I went down to my knees and grabbed it. God, Lord. I was, that's, I can't boat flip it because she's in the back of the boat. And that's an A-rig that I'm throwing. Oh, so I didn't even think of that. Yeah. And they get, they're still pretty young. So they get scared when a big fish 
is flopping around the boat. <laughs> you got to have some good stories. Have they actually gotten their first fish, that first memory? Uh, yeah. So I took my daughter caught her first fish out there when we were bed fishing. So I had a little dark sleeper and I put it on an ultralight. I was like, okay, I'll cast it in and I'll tell you when to start reeling. And as soon as it hit the bed, it was just boom. I was like, okay, oh start God. reeling. Yeah. But my oh, just my crazy. son, he uh he's still a little too little for it because I've been pelted with some lead in the back of the head and hooked oh, from God. So I'll hook it and then let him reel it in when we're out there. Unless I feel it's a giant. I'm like, okay. Mm. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. I, I think we talked about this uh, on yesterday. Wow, it really was yesterday. Getting kids hooked on fishing and how long they can stay out. And that is such a very, you have to be mindful of that as whether you're trying to be a, you know, if you're a parent or if you're a co fishing coach, something like that, they can't stand to be out there for 10 hours, you know, staring at a graph. They're going to get burnt out. They're going to hate it. And you've got to make it's sure tough. it's just enough. Yeah. I mean, it's tough because my son who goes out with me, he's three. And like I told you yesterday, he's good for like an hour or so, but you just got to bring snacks and dress him warm. <laughs> Because when, I mean, it was maybe 40, 50, no, I'd say 40, 45 degrees. And I just put a bunch of jackets on him, put him in the back of the boat. And he's excited to be out there. So that's awesome. Yeah. He's a trooper. When do you think you can start fishing tournaments then? How old is he, by the way? Three. So Three? it's going to oh, be a okay. while. Yeah. 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 Matt, Matt doesn't have anything <laughs> to worry about. He, he, he still gets, has his job. He gets upset every time I leave. Like I left, when I left yesterday, he saw me getting ready and he was like, where are you going? I'm coming with you. Oh, that's like, no, so buddy, awesome. not, not today. Dude, that's freaking awesome. I mean, I mean, getting them hooked in this stuff is so important, especially in Loudoun County, because that place has gotten so weird. Um, I, I I call them hipsters, but they're just the, not the the locals. Like, I, I grew up in Western Loudoun where there was a lot of farms. My, my parents had a farm. And to watch that slowly get eaten away with just all these buildings and stuff, and you lose that hunting and fishing mindset. And, you know, if you go to Valley High School or Woodgrove High School now in Percival, you wouldn't even know that's a thing unless your yeah. family introduces it to you. Yeah. And it, it, I try to get them out every time I go, but I don't know, this winter I might be a little reluctant. So, so now we guys, let's, uh, I know you guys are just absolutely flooding the comment section right now. And we're definitely going to get to all your questions here. As always, let's talk Woodbridge. Ooh, that's a good one. Let's bring that one out. Phil's Adams. Let's talk Woodbridge. That's got to be a good question. And then for everyone that just joined, we got 35 people watching right now. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. This is how it works. Uh, ask a question down below. I'll pick them randomly, and you'll win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Ask a question, win a gift card. That's how this works. Um, so this one right here is, let's talk about Woodbridge. So what does that mean? No idea. What is Woodbridge? Yeah, let us know down below. What <laughs> is Woodbridge? Uh, we have a good one here. Um, what was the water temperatures at Frederick? I think it was 52, 50, 55? 52. It was 52. 52 degrees. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about that day, and this is the one thing, guys, which is kind of cool. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to do a live stream was just, it, it, I wanted to try it because over think my wife works on Thanksgiving. So I'm probably going to go out Thanksgiving or Black Friday and do a live stream there. But I wanted to even see if it worked. So I was just wanted to see how it worked and we ended up keeping the camera on all day. But what was nice is we got to be on the water yesterday to be able to talk about it today. The fish were way more active. And I think this is very important for fishermen. The fish are way more active in cold water than you think. When you think 50 degree, 40 degree water, you think they're going to be sandwiched on the bottom. Those, some fish we saw on live scope were moving, like booking it. Yeah, no, that's what amazed me too. When I was out there in the winter. Like that, I told you that nine pounder chased my A rig 40 feet before it bit. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it, I mean, it moved a lot quicker than the fish that we saw yesterday, but they move fast. And you saw when we were throwing the scrounger around a little bit, I mean, they bolted on it. it. They did. And I want to bring that up too. Like when we started that day out there, why did you pick the scrounger? And actually, if you could bring that up, that'd be awesome. Just because it's clear. It's, it, I don't know, ever since I've, I mean, fishing the res, it's not really clear now, but fishing clear water out there for some reason, it's worked for me. I mean, I don't fish normal like other people. I'll throw crazy stuff when you're not even supposed to. And it just, sometimes it works. 
How did you get onto the scrounger though? Because that seems like a very much a, a Tennessee TVA system. The only reason I know about it is because someone in the comments there, uh, John <laughs> Hudgens, please raise your hand. <laughs> so he uh, he got my brother onto it, and then since then I've been throwing it here and there. But other than the A rig, I just I feel like sometimes they'll get spooked by the rig, and then you just throw you know that single bait, and they'll they'll attack it. That was interesting to watch in the and, ideally. And, you get John Hungerson right there. Ideally, that was something interesting to watch on the scope. Was while you were throwing the A rig and the scrounger, I was trying to go on the other end of the spectrum and go super subtle spy bait because I guess it's my brand now. And then I was throwing a Demiki yeah. rig. I had so many fish. I swear to God, a couple of them looked big, and I'm picturing it was like four or five pounds. They would nose up to it and either just grab the tail or just breathe on it and that's it. Couldn't get them to bite. But somehow in that clear water, you burning that scrounger got some reaction bites. That it looked like they hit you pretty hard too. They, the ones that did bite, they did. But when you're out there and if you're going to scope them, you'll find, you'll probably have 60 fish. If you go out in a full day, they'll just sit right behind it and follow it and follow it all the way to the boat and they'll just disappear. But sometimes if you can follow them, they'll, you'll, see them shoot down to the bottom like they did yesterday and you can keep on hitting them and hitting them and i found that you can get them to bite it just you just have to keep dissing them off i guess what depth range are you looking for when you're out there or is it basically whatever the live scope tells you to do uh if it's dead of winter i'm looking at 20 to 25 2025 yeah like we yesterday i'd say we caught them in about 20 or they Mm -hmm. were coming out of 20 feet the week prior, I caught a couple in 25 feet. So they're there. I just don't think they're ready yet. And I think this is another thing that in the comment section got me spurred on. And, you know, I, I showed you the message. and We talked about that a little bit off off camera. And, and one thing I think it's interesting about live scope. This is the thing no one talks about. Everyone wants to talk about the sniping because it's cool. It's sexy. It's the big glamorous thing. I think live scope is the information you get to either make a decision to leave or to make adjustments. We got into an area of the lake where those fish, if you didn't have live scope, you would think it's gone, move on. With live scope, we figured out within 15 minutes that they were doing a circle. They were literally, if you watch the boat and you speed up the live stream, we just spiraled the boat trying to follow them and they were just doing a loop. And, and, you know, Ace, I was telling you before the show, it's like what we should have done is just position the boat on that angle and just stayed locked there and just kept making yeah. the cast and waited for them to come yeah. back. Just Without live scope, you wouldn't have known. The track. Yeah. yeah. No, and I wish we would have found it earlier because that group of fish that we found definitely would have eaten, a, you know, the rig or the scrounger or whatever we threw in there. We just, we found it at the end of the day when I had to leave. So it, it could have been fun. Yeah, and I think I think it's going to get better as it gets colder out. Um, w- one question really comes down with the A rig. I'm not good with that. I've never fished it a lot. Um, bouncing between Maryland and, and and Virginia, guys, it's not an excuse, but dealing with different regulations there, I just never got really into A rig fishing. What are some tips and tricks just for people trying to start out with A rig fishing? Just cast and pray. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, if you Honestly, I wouldn't throw it if I didn't have live scope. It's very tough because there's so much stuff on Frederick to get hung up in. You could easily lose $300 out there in a day. Mm-hmm. Just in st- I mean, it's, you definitely need live scope out. I mean, I guess not if you rig it weedless. I mean, I do. It's very unconventional, but I can do it that way, especially if I'm fishing those deep brush piles. I'll do it because if you're using live, you don't know, like, it looks like your bait's going directly through it, but you could be off to the side. So if I'm going to fish those, I will rig it weedless. So if I do go through it, I'm not going to get hung up. That's but, really, really smart. How, how do you weight it to actually get it down? Let me show you real quick. I'll show you what I throw on. Oh, this is going to be the juice. So, Here's the folks. Here's the juice. No, if, no, no, no. If I'm rigging it weedless, and again, I'm very unconventional. I'm throwing, let me see if you can see it. On the quarter, oh. that's what I'm throwing. And I'll throw these swim baits. I got them here somewhere. Um, sometimes I'll throw smaller ones, but I'm definitely throwing the Kaizy Tech or Kaizy Tech, Kai Tech Easy Shiner. Now, 
this I'm not gonna tell you the color. This isn't it. But that's that's what I'm throwing my teasers on. And then the main one on the back is just a four inch contact, same thing. Just or sorry, it's uh bigger than four. I think it's the four eight. But um all white on the back. I'll give you that. All white on the back. B blades or no blades? Blades. Because I'm Why? throwing the uh which one am I throwing? What is it here? It's the young. That's the one I'm throwing. So I don't have it here. No, but uh, it's just because it came with blades, dude. It had it on there, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to chuck it. We got some good questions here. Um, <clears throat> so we got Matthew Foreman. You just want a gift card to Jake Spate and Tackle. Uh, I think I got your name right. I'm sorry. I have issues speaking. Uh, what depth do they usually sit around in Lake Frederick this time of year? Oh, man, this time mm -hmm. of year, um, like we found them in 20 feet. You can find them shallower for sure. I just haven't been able to get them to bite. We tried yeah. Ned rigs. I tried a jig. Yeah. I tried you a tried ton thing. of stuff. You I fish just, it way different than I would because you were grabbing, you would throw something, grab a different rod, throw it out. And I'm sitting there with the scrounger and the A-rig. I, I threw maybe, I had four rods on the deck, but I really only threw two of them. And, and one question I've gotten a lot is like, why do I flip so much? Honestly, it's doing team tournaments so long. If I know the A-rig is going to work, I want to keep trying different things to see if there's another bite going. And because I now have live scope, if I don't get them to react, I'm not going to, to stick with it very long. The Damiki rig was weird because they weren't ignoring it. That was why I feel like, again, I watched the live stream just to kind of check myself to see what I did wrong. They kept nosing up to it, which made it really hard for me to say like, no, I, I didn't want to fish that anymore. I thought maybe one would eventually commit. They just never freaking did. Um, I mean, if you go around that place, you definitely find some that would. Because like I said, I'll stick with one bait throughout the day because I know they'll eat it eventually. Um, and you definitely could, but you did the right thing by changing bait sizes too. Because like, again, we didn't know what, what size those blue back were. And that's going to be a good question that we have that, we, that we'll bring up here. And then uh, uh, SB Fishing said, uh, "Yum Flash Mob Junior." Yeah, there we go. Yum is. Flash Mob Junior. That's, that's my juice. Uh, and we got this one here by Travis Cyber. Uh, Magnum spoons have been catching good fish on Frederick. If you don't get them stuck in the five hundred brush pile brush piles that are mm -hmm. in there, um, I think Mister McCluskey actually did that last summer. Uh, he dropped the magnum spoon there. And I think you were yeah, even he's caught him. That. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. He he's definitely caught him on it. Um I've had him dance all around it, but I just can't. I, I I've caught a couple, but not not as many as he could if he went out there with it. The bait forage size there is very interesting. Uh blueback herring can get almost 10 to 12 inches long, depending like it like Murray or like Hartwell, they can get massive. And and they're just super long, like snakes. How does that adjust your bait size? You said like they're, if they're bigger, you throw bigger baits, right? Yeah, and I will throw um, I'll throw the Magnum fluke on a scrounder, and I've caught him out there with that too. And it's what is it? So that's seven inches. And that's a massive fluke. Do you got and one then, we could show off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard the bag. Yeah, I got my as Matt would know, it's called a death bag. It's just all the lures I throw into a bag at the end of the day. Oh wow. There we go. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, seven inches. Damn, that's insane. Oh, and then I, I don't think I asked this. How heavy was that scrounger head you're using to get down to 20, 30 feet of water? Uh, the smaller one I was throwing was half ounce, and then the bigger one is one ounce. Damn, I did not know they made them that big. Yeah, yeah. That it's, is something. It's hefty. It's huge. I got to get into that. That's something I just, I never got into the scrounger stuff. I always thought that was a TVA lake system kind of deal uh, with, with those scroungers. It works. Um, man. Let's see. We got uh, HP, HP fishing. Nice to see the smarter half of SBTV uh, dropping some knowledge. Um, do with that what you will. I'm not, I'm not touching that <laughs> that's, one. That's your all's buddy. <laughs> I know who he is. Uh, Montclair Lake, Occoquan, and then, oh my God, Lake Tarpine, Tarpin, Turpiting. Something like that. I've got no idea where that is. Yeah. Montclair, Lake Occoquan. And that's a good question. Like, what are some other lakes in Northern Virginia that you fish that are public knowledge that are decent in the wintertime? Dude, all I go, I, I can't get really get out much. So if I'm going out fishing right now, it's either the Res or Frederick. Like, I've gone out to um, 
Shenandoah a couple times and fish for smallmouth out there this time of year. Um, right now, maybe well, late October and now is pretty good. At least I've had good luck out there with McCluskey. We went out there and had a 60 fish day. I mean, it was insane. We were throwing one bait all day. Matt figured it out. And it was every other cast we were catching something or getting bit. I mean, it, mm. it was wild. But other than that, I don't get out too much. Um, so when I do get out, I'm trying to go to places I know where I can try to catch a big one. Wow. And that's what's so important this time of year, guys, is just get out there and you can actually, um, I, I know, guys, I know. Sorry, my other comment section is blowing up right now as well. Um, it's so important to get out there in this winter and to find specific areas that you're going to have success. And the thing is, don't spend too much time. Um, I think that is the one misnomer about wintertime fishing. Don't sit in one area and just milk it for all it's worth. Move around, find some more active fish. And that's what we did. And and with without live scope, you need to be doing the exact same thing. If you watched what we did yesterday, we didn't camp in one area. We gave it a couple of casts and we moved. And that's what you should do whether you have live scope or you don't have live scope. It's very important not to get locked into the idea that it's cold, therefore don't move. If I didn't have it and I was out there, I would go to every single point, and just fan cast it, move to the next. That's there, that's what I would do. There's so many trees. I People say there's a lot of trees in that lake, but it is a ton of trees <laughs> The standing standing timber there is crazy. Like if yeah. you're standing up, there's a good chance you could throw yourself out of your boat there if you're not paying attention. Oh, I, dude, I 100 percent believe that, especially in the back yeah. too. Um, and, and I've known there's wood in the back, but not down near the dam like there is. Like there is so much that they can hide in, and that's where I think live scope is so important. Like you said, you got to get your bait so close to that wood, and if you didn't have it, like I wouldn't be throwing a spy bait around that stuff without it, with that nope. I wouldn't at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, you're going to lose a ton of stuff if you don't have it. Um, so it's tough without it. Whoever that was, your voicemail did not save. So give us a call again. And then we got this here. Stephen Lloyd fishing ace. When you catch a bass over 22 inches and or over eight pounds, are you turning them in for citation? If so, how deep is your stack of plaques? Damn. That's no. a hell of a question. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I catch them, weigh them. Uh, I will put them in the live well for a little bit. My kids like to mess with them and I like seeing them in there swimming around. So I'll toss them in there, let them cool down for a little bit, uh, take a couple pictures and just throw them back. Uh, and if, I mean, if, I mean, I could get the plaques for them. Uh, I have one, I think, but yeah, I just, I'm not too big on that. I'm just more about catching it, getting it back in the water. Why? I guess I could. I mean, you have to, to get the citation, don't you have to call DWR and everything, get them to come in, certify it? Yeah, you, you do. I've heard, I think I was listening to one of your podcasts uh, earlier this week about it. I mean, it's a huge process to get that done. If, uh, so I've got three fish out of Frederick that are over eight. So I, I would have three plaques from there, but yeah. Here we go. I believe just a photo of a fish over 22 inches gets a plaque. Really? I'd have to Google oh, that. Yeah, because I thought you had to weigh it by a certified scale. All right. We got another person trying to call in here. Let's see who we got here. I can hear your phone buzzing. All right. Perfect. Were they were they saying anything or no? Just saying hello, hello, hello over uh, again. Uh, Virginia Game will review the photos and accept or deny. Let's, I don't have... well. No, I've got the golden rule, but mine only goes up to 18 inches, I think. Really? Other than that, I don't have a board. Yeah. I don't have a board that would have the length for it. Oh, interesting. And then we got one more here. Let me get this one up. Uh, all you have to do, all you have to do is, all, all you have to do is photo the fish on the scale and photo of the measurement. I would personally take it in, though, just to have them look at it, honestly. Yeah, and I, I thought that's what you had to do. I thought you had to get a certified scale, get the DWR out, and a witness for it. So, to me, it, well, I think that was going to happen with McCluskey's uh, crappie, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but I think, like, I see in the comments there, they said it might be for just state records, which I think his was. Because mm. I were going to go for Jared, yeah. You, you talked to, I forget his name, but you two talked about it in a podcast. Um, yeah okay i think i know you're talking about um i forget his name but yeah you definitely talked to someone about it deep creek lake yep deep creek lake absolutely 
Yeah, the guy from Deep Creek Lake, he has like over like 22 citations to his name. And yeah, for a citation, I think it is differently than a, uh, a state record, which is like with Odin. Oh, uh, with yeah. Odin. Yeah. 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 Yep. State records are different. Yep. The Jeremy Nicely. Yep. Absolutely. No, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I don't know. And that's something too. It's like if you could catch a state record, but you had to kill it, would you do it? No. I couldn't do it personally. It was I, catching a big fish like that. Like my live well isn't that nice on the boat. I mean, unless I bring my cooler system. I mean, I have one on my boat, but it's not worth keeping a fish in longer than 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. But again, to, to keep a fish that size and know you're going to kill it for a state record, I couldn't do it. I would be really frustrated with that. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe a I mean, world record. If I have the pictures and the scale, uh, at least I know I got it. But yeah, I wouldn't kill that fish for it. Yeah, we got a couple more here. And then what's the place that you want to fish or what type of tournaments are you going to fish next year? I'll be at the res tournaments again. I'd love to fish bigger tournaments. I just don't have a big enough boat for them. Like I knew I could fish as a co in some of the BFLs. I've done it once and actually zeroed on it down at Smith Mountain Lake. Um, but I don't know. It's hard to fish in as a co in those. So I'd like to, yeah. I'd like to fish it as a boater. Especially when all you've done your whole life is, you know, control the boat. I think that's where it's weird. It's like going from the front of the boat to the back of the boat again. Well, I don't um, control it though. Matt's usually the one who sits up there and we'll fish it. And then, you know, we switch off here and there. So it's not like I'm in the back the whole time or in the front the whole time. Um, okay. But if I was in a big tournament like that, yeah, I'd rather be in control than sit in the back and get second pickings. If you could get a boat, then would you want to fish the BFLs in those type of tournaments or would you still want to stay local? No, I'd fish the BFLs. I'd love to fish other places, bigger waters. I just don't have really the time or the boat to do it. I mean, I guess I could do it in the John boat, but again, time's a big thing. Mm hmm especially especially now having kids like to to be able to do that and then uproot and yeah. move around it's just it's a it's a completely different lifestyle it really is yeah because i talked to matt about when he fishes his bfls and everything he's you, know, you get out pre-fish a couple days before and i definitely can't with work and everything i can't do that but true for him that's also like his job which is a little yeah. different yeah yeah, mean, yeah that's he doesn't have to tell his boss where he's going and then which is like it's just yeah, yeah he is his own boss yeah, he is his own boss. <laughs> For better or worse, he is his own boss. Yeah. Uh, we got Bassin with big B. I caught my PB 24.5, and you have to have a measuring board and pick to get length citation and certify scale to get weight verified. I had to print out my plaque, just a piece of paper. Interesting. I wonder if that's specific to Virginia or if that's all states. You know, I do. So mine is from Virginia off of Gaston. And I want to say it's a citation. I think my dad sent the information in. And the only reason it was a citation is because I think, I think it was seven. It was seven and a half pounds, but it beat the citation length. And I think it was 20. Hmm. I want to say 22 and a half, but I could be wrong. Interesting. I wonder... Yeah, it is just a piece of paper. It wasn't a plaque. And that's what's kind of sad, too. I think it was a plaque. It'd actually be way more envious of people people would actually pursue that a lot more than if yeah. it is just a piece of paper but the idea of just catching citation fish and different fish that that's not something people like to do it, it like if you had to catch like and so in saltwater really made this sexy where it's like you could do the grand slam which is i think like uh, the flats grand slam or the backwater backwater is a red fish a snook and i think a tarpon like yeah. that's pretty cool you don't really have that in freshwater mm -mm. How, well some people do the grand slam where they're like they find out the species in that lake and then we'll try to catch every one Mm -hmm. or at least for the day at least that's what i would call a grand slam go out in one day and catch it the species that are in there all right guys let me uh let's make sure i get through everyone's yeah. questions here um let's see uh sb i i hope we hear from boyd duckett jr tonight i really hope so too um i don't know what's going on i must have uh i must have punched some buttons by mistake but by the end of the show i, I can try to give boyd duckett jr a call again hopefully i can get things fixed up there um we got this thumbs up everything's good looking forward to the show uh next week yes we will have doc on the show next week live from jake's bait and tackle the only lake i fear is sleepy creek sleepy creek will be an interesting one to shoot a hidden gems episode on that one's a pretty That's, cool lake. i want to go there i've looked it up on the maps i've had a buddy of mine who's gone up there and fished 
Um, and he said, it's good. I, mean, I like to get up there with live and see what it's all about. Massive lily pad fields. Massive lily pad That's fields. That's what he said. He's like, there's lily pads everywhere. It, it, it really also has the watercolor of Florida, that tea stained like color. Yeah. It, that's what it really feels like um but it's so it's so weird to get to it's like you have to go up a side of a mountain and back down and it's a clay road so that's it's a little virginia. sketchy what that's west virginia for you that, that pretty much is, that is actually, <laughs> yeah yeah that, that, that's not nowhere. let's see we got that let's talk woodbridge we got that one done we got the depth lake frederick okay perfect i think we're getting all these questions done all you have to do is photograph the fish, which any game will review the photo, accept or deny for state record. Odenkirk, I think we got all the questions done. Perfect. Guys, yeah, thank you so much. Um, coming up, when does the Fountainhead tournaments get started again, and when will you start pre-fishing? Uh, I, I, they're probably going to start. I don't know. It changes. Sometimes it's early March. Sometimes it's late March. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, It'll definitely be in March, and if I'm going to pre-fish it, I'll probably go out a couple weeks before because again, it's leading up until there. I'm only going to be at Frederick. Hmm. That's it. Yeah. But no, I'm yeah. excited for the next season. Matt, we're coming for you. <laughs> what time of year do you like to fish the most? Uh, you know, it's funny. It used to be summer. I used to love summer fishing like early or late spring, early summer, but now it's just winter. It's just when the big ones bite, man. And it's so much easier in live. I, 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 what I like it about it the most is like there's not a lot of people out in the water. You get the water to yourself. And I feel like now yeah. more and more tournaments and more and more people are understanding like the coolness of actually being out there at this time of year. And it's, it's losing that for me a little bit. Like not, not, not completely. I, I still think winter is the, like for smallmouth, this is my favorite time to get out on the rivers, the Shenandoah, up Potomac. This is when you're going to catch some freaking footballs, absolute footballs. Yeah. I, I probably should go fish the Shenandoah right now too. Because oh, I'm yeah. sure there's some giants you can catch right now. And it, Riverton? Again, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the only problem is I've actually gone over the Shenandoah on 7, and the water looks so low. I don't think I could launch my boat out of Riverton right now. It yeah. might be sketchy. I mean, honestly, you should come up to Big Slack with me. I mean, we might catch a big one, or we might catch 700, like, 12 inches. But, like, that's I, fine, man. Oh, dude. I mean, <laughs> last tournament, I caught, like, 40 fish. Um I got third place with five pounds. I mean, it kind of tells you about that place, but the water temperature was 48 degrees and they were still chewing. Like it's yeah. insane how cold that those guys will keep biting. Um, let's see. We've got a good one yeah. here. The Delaware has a good program with paper certification and five species is elite. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I just would like, it's not just a paper. It'd be cool if they could put a little money into like a plaque. I don't know. Yeah. Even if you had to pay for it, I bet more people would go for it. You know, if oh. you get a plaque from them. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. And we got Tyler. When are you going to start guiding on Frederick? Uh, for Tyler, I know you're coming up here soon. I'll take you out for free, buddy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, he's a friend of ours. Now, do you have any more baits that we, we forgot to show off here before we, we wind down for the evening? Uh, no, not really, man. There's there's a couple I have in this bag that I could show you, but that's what I throw out there in the winter. That I, Oh, you got a couple more in the bag? Yeah, I do have some here. It's mainly colors that I throw that have worked more than others. Um, but I told you, it's the rig. But yeah, I don't know if the color actually means a lot. Um, but it could. So I don't know if I want to give it all up. Maybe we'll maybe that. after the maybe after the winter is over, then I'll show everybody. We'll, we'll save that for the uh, the next live stream that we do on the water, guys. Um, but then again, uh, what is? Oh, here we go. Here's another good one. What's Riverton like? dangerous <laughs> <laughs> launching out of there's day i first time i went there um i went with mccluskey actually and while we were running we're running like 20 miles an hour and i look over the side of the boat and we're in a foot of water and i was like oh my god he's like it's okay i know where we're going we're good <laughs> but until you get down towards like uh what is that the bridge of 66 once you get under there you're fine it's a lot I mean, it's probably the deepest down there is maybe 12 feet. No, actually, there's a spot that's probably about 20. Hmm. But further up, yeah. yeah, it's shallow. Down by the dam you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It's a small stretch, though, Riverton. And that's where you got to come up to Big it Slack. Is, it's not that big, but the one stretch that we do fish. 
A sipping some peach goodness. Yeah, that that yeah, actually can't wait to listen to this live. Yep, 100 percent guys. And then yeah, for all of my patrons, that's that's tomorrow night. We're gonna do a Patreon only live stream as well. Um Ace, what do you have coming up on your schedule? Uh shoot, fishing wise, not much, man. Really. It, anytime that I'm off work and I have time, like I said, you can find me out, Frederick. That's where I'll be. Mm. That's where that's where I'm gonna take you later in the summer or the winter. No, uh, yeah, dude. Anytime yeah. you want to go fishing, I'll be around, uh, ready to go. Um, again, guys, you know, please, you know, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Uh, a little bit shorter live stream tonight, but don't worry. Tomorrow, we come back with Patreon only members uh, stream as well, and then we'll be doing a live stream from the water either Thanksgiving or Friday, and then next Monday, live from Jake's for the two-year anniversary show. That one's going to be a long show. Stay tuned for that. Uh, please, the people that did win a a gift card tonight, email me, message me, get a hold of me, and you'll get your gift card. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.